Welcome to the online gathering of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Little Rock. I'm Laurie smith Prudhomme, and I'm a member of the choir, and I'm one of the church pianists. Whether you are a longtime member or tuning in for the first time, we are glad you have chosen to worship with us today. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you are welcome here. Our opening words come from Nelson Mandela. For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. I invite you to join in the affirmation of covenant. These are words of promise that we say each week, words that bind us together as a community of faith. Please say them with me. Love is the doctrine of this church the quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other. We light the chalice this morning with words from Ellen Hamilton entitled, Faith in Summer. In faith, together, we light this small scrap of light, symbol of Grandfather Son's enormous power, whose energy burns so brightly in these days of deep summer, catapulting the leaves and vines, vegetables, flowers, and fruits to astonishing size, lengths, and heights spilling over the tops of cages, walls, and trellises, delighting and nourishing all beings. We bask in the warmth and the heat of these days with lightened hearts and quickened senses, in gratitude and in faith.
Good morning, my name is Rebecca Retzel and I'm happy to be with you this morning. This last Sunday marked the conclusion of the UU's General Assembly. This is an annual gathering of UU's, which was held June 24th through 28th. It would have taken place in Providence, Rhode Island, but this year it was turned completely virtual due to COVID-19 concerns. A gathering that typically brings three to four or more thousand UU's together to worship, work, and fellowship. This year's virtual assembly had more than 49 registrants. From the comfort of our own homes, we zoomed our way through elements that make general assembly what it is. Worship, workshops, discussion groups, working sessions, keynote speakers, yoga, dancing, drumming, chanting, coffee hours, concerts. There was even a drag show. This was my first GA and my first virtual conference, but not my first annual church conference. So I did feel pangs of grief at times, thinking about the feelings of waking up in the morning and walking to the main hall with your coffee in one hand and your heavy dope bag in the other. The way that the music of 4,000 voices singing together resonates deep in my bones pulling out my knitting projects as I settle into an interesting session. And those interactions with people and random strangers as you shuffle from one room to the next. Those parts of an assembly experience that can only be experienced in person. But truth be told, as I reflected on my GA experience, I did experience all of those things I traded my heavy tote bag of books for a 27 pound child. I traded my knitting needles for a chop saw and a drill and rebuilt shelves in my laundry room. I sang out loud, I cried, I was moved by the faces and the voices and the effort that it took to create such a robust musical lineup day after day after day. All the while, I followed a very lively text chat thread with Sue and Marcy and Lori as we shared our experiences, compared notes and debated workshop choices and worked through some technical difficulties. I am so grateful I had the opportunity to attend GA. I come away with it with a feeling of connectedness, a feeling of revival, and no suitcase, no suitcase of dirty laundry to unpack. The plan is to hold GA in Milwaukee next year from June 23rd to 27th, that's 2021. But the virtual conference will also be available. I highly encourage you to consider taking part in person or online, I promise you will not be disappointed. I feel proud to be a UU. And Marcy, Laurie, and a few, and Sue are also going to share some reflections about their experience at GA. Hi, I'm Sue McDonald. I'm the newly elected board president for UUCLR, and I'm looking forward to a great year. I attended General Assembly. This year's General Assembly was the first ever totally virtual meeting. I had no idea how they were going to pull it off, but considering I had spoken with Cass regarding the challenges that she, John Perez, and the tech team faced just trying to get our worship service on Zoom. Well, to say the least, it was a monumental feat, is to put it mildly. Their tech team did a superb job. Yes, there were some glitches, but as a whole, it went extremely well. There were over 4,900 attendees from 49 states, the third largest GA gathering. Can you just imagine? Each day started off with a worship service with a different speaker. They had virtual music and choirs at these services, and they were fantastic. Then at nine o'clock, they had at least eight to 10 different workshops on varied topics. At 11, there were a few more workshops offered. The general sessions were when they held the business meetings, 
with pros and cons for each topic, voting, and then the results were posted. Can you imagine over 3,000 people around the U.S. meeting virtually for a general session that included voting? It was amazing. At 5 or 5.30, there were reflection sessions where attendees got together in a chat and talked about the day's events and their takeaways. Each workshop, workshop and general session had chat, so attendees could voice their questions and their opinions. Someone on the virtual tech team would watch the chat and address the comments and questions to the moderator to be answered. Marcy Riggs, Lori smith Prudon, Rebecca Retzel, and I texted during the general sessions. And that was not only a lot of fun, but it helped me to feel connected to both the international group of UUs throughout the world and to my own congregation at UUCLR. And of course, it was exciting to share the experience. UU The Vote, a UUA project to encourage voting, held several sessions and offered the ability for people to get involved during GA, making calls to people in Texas. The four of us are hoping to get involved with this group and others in our local community during this election season. More on that at another time. There was a reflective listening worship that I workshop that I really enjoyed and felt connected to. It was called active listening when I was in college. It is a great tool to help congregations learn how to listen respectfully and support our behavioral covenant. I hope to share some of what I learned in the future with our congregation. Saturday night's speaker was Canadian author and filmmaker Naomi Klein, the inaugural Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair of Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University in New Jersey. She's known for her political analysis and criticism of corporate globalization and capitalism. She endorses the Green De New Green Deal and spoke about it at, during her session. She was an engaging speaker and quick on her feet when answering questions from the chat. All in all, General Assembly was a wonderful experience. I now look forward to going next year on a road trip with my other attendees. Thank you so much for the opportunity to attend and to represent our congregation. Good morning, everyone. So I did have the privilege to attend um, GA as a delegate for our church. One of my, I just loved it. If you ever get a chance to go or go virtually, you should. One of my favorite workshops I went to was held by Galen Gingrich, who is a minister at All Souls Church, Unitarian Church in New York City. He's written a new book and it's called Grat the Way of Gratitude, a new spiritual spirituality for today, I can't speak. And it was very moving to me because he talked about grat using gratitude as spiritual practice. He explains that everything in the universe is made up of relationships. We are defined not by how we are independent of people around us, but how we are connected to everyone and everything. Spirituality is not about focusing just on me, but it's focusing on how I'm connected to everyone and to everything. A spiritual practice of gratitude opens us up and it, it focuses on that fundamental truth, leads us to the fundamental truth of our connectedness and our reciprocity, and that's how we, we need to pay attention to that. Gratitude is not about thank you, but it's also, it's about also looking at relationships to all things, and it's a broader and deeper understanding of those relationships and the reciprocity and what it means to live in reciprocity to all of our relationships. And I want to read one thing from his book. It says, gratitude is a way of life that when consistently practiced, leads to an abiding sense of joy. Joy at being alive, joy at being part of this amazing ecosystem we call planet Earth, joy at being able 
to bring to begin each morning with the gift of a new day joy at being able to love and work and sometimes struggle and occasionally fall and then begin again I encourage you to look this book up and get it. It's very good. And again, if you get a chance to ever go to GA, it is very, it is wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much and y'all have a good day. I'd like to take a few minutes this morning to tell you about my experience at General Assembly last weekend. First, I'd like to thank the church and the board for the opportunity to attend. It was my first GA and it was fantastic. I particularly loved all the music in the worship services. I even liked the music they played while we waited for sessions to start. And I got a lot of good ideas for different ways I might play some of the hymns we sing on Sundays. So thank you. One of the sessions that I attended was called You, you The Vote. And their themes or hashtags are Vote Love, Defeat Hate. UU The Vote is a movement within the UUA to combat voter disenfranchisement and to mobilize voters to go to the polls in November and beyond. One of the speakers said, justice is what love looks like in public. And that's what UU The Vote is about, figuring out ways that people might have trouble voting and what we can do to help. So they're looking at making sure people are registered to vote, that their addresses are current on the record, that they can get to the polls, and most importantly, that there are enough poll workers and observers on election day. We know that many of our poll worker volunteers are older and will be staying home because of COVID-19. So we have to figure out ways to make sure that everyone can vote and vote safely. They also want us to be watching the movement to defund the post office, which would have a tremendous effect on absentee, ballot, absentee um, ballots and mailing in ballots. So we'll be thinking about ways that uh, members of our church can help, little ways and big ways, as we make sure that everyone can safely vote. And also to be making sure that we're aware that when one group is hurt, that all of us are affected. And so we're gonna be thinking about how to show justice as love in public. Thank you. At this time, we pause to recognize the milestones and meditations of our community, both spoken and unspoken. Linda Van Blaricom reports that she is continuing to do well, and we continue to cheer you on, Linda. As always, we send you our love. We are thinking of all among us who are undergoing medical testing or waiting on results, who are receiving treatments or therapies, we are thinking of all in our world who are sick, of those who are grieving the loss of someone they love, and everyone who is trying to find some footing in these uncertain times. We send strength for the journey, along with the support and love of our community. The reading for today is entitled, How Come? These are lyrics by American singer, songwriter, and musician, Ray LeMontagne, from his first album, Trouble. People on the street now, 
faces long and grim, souls are feeling heavy, and faith is growing thin. Fears are getting stronger, you can feel them on the rise. Hopelessness got some by the throat, you can see it in their eyes. I said, how come? How come everybody on a shoestring, everybody in a hole, everybody on this old jet plane crossing their fingers and toes? Government man spin his politics till they got you pinned. Everybody trying to reach out to each other, but they don't know where to begin. I said, how come I can't tell the free world from living hell? I said, how come all I see is a child of God in misery? How come? The pistol now is prophet, the bullet, some kind of lord and king. But pain is the only promise that this so-called savior is going to bring. Love can be a liar, and justice can be a thief. And freedom can be an empty cup from which everybody want to drink. I said, how come I can't tell the free world from living hell? I said, how come all I see is a child of God in misery? I said, how come it's just man killing man, killing man, killing man, killing man, killing man? I don't understand it. I don't understand. I said, how come? How come? As I mentioned in my General Assembly reflection, I traded my knitting needles for a chop saw and a drill to keep my hands busy during sessions this year. The laundry room of my house was a selling point when we first saw it. It was big with two windows and a utility sink and it had tons of shelving from the previous owners who I knew did a lot of home canning. It was so much better than any of my previous laundry rooms. We bought the house, we moved in, and the room quickly became a mess. The existing shelves just weren't quite right. The spacing was weird, they weren't attached well, the metal brackets on the ends were pokey and became a little hazardous once we had little ones tottering around. We tried shifting the existing shelves around and Mike tried building additional shelves like the old ones to see if that would quiet my complaints. It didn't. For years, redoing those shelves was my top project. But between working full time and starting a family, it never happened. I just never felt ready to take on such a big project. The shelves weren't broken. They were functional in many aspects. Redoing them would displace a huge amount of stuff and create a hopefully temporary mess. It would take planning and time, it would cost money. And was it really worth it? <sighs> I would stand in the room and then feel overwhelmed and walk away. And yet, the laundry room is not a room that I can avoid. I knew it could be better and I couldn't stop thinking about it. GA gave me a rare opportunity to embark on such an effort I set out to redo one wall, just one wall. I made a rough sketch, took some measurements, and brought home a stack of lumber. The combination of beautiful, moving, rolling GA sessions and this physical transformation that was taking place in front of me created a truly robust few days for my body and my soul. Energy in, energy out, each feeding the other, leaving me at the end of each day feeling satisfied and revived. I didn't want to stop. I finished the shelves just as the closing session came on Sunday afternoon. I felt so excited. I was so proud. And if you're one who follows analogies, feel free to draw any lessons from the story so far. My intended analogy has yet to come. With one wall of the laundry room completed, I had achieved my goal. I shifted my energy to preparing for this service. I had a rough framework of my sermon and I didn't think it would take too long to get that on paper. But Monday passed, Tuesday passed, 
Wednesday passed. No sermon. I just couldn't stop thinking about those other three walls in my laundry room. I forced myself to sit down so that I would work on my sermon. Instead, I found myself sketching out a design, taking some measurements, and returning from the hardware store with another stack of lumber. Building the new shelves would be easy, but before anything could be rebuilt, all the existing shelves would have to be emptied and dismantled. That was a daunting task. Bigger than the one previous wall, and all day Thursday, I took the existing homemade shelving system down. The more pieces I took down, the more I could see how poorly these shelves had been constructed. The more I worked, the angrier I got. Who built these? Nothing was anchored to the walls correctly. The metal brackets were haphazardly cut and bent, leaving some uneven ends. The hardware that didn't fit right or boards that weren't cut to the right length were just forced and jammed into place. It didn't come down easy. I bloodied my arms and my fingers and my head at one point. I had to use several tools, even some tools I'd never used before, but now have a great appreciation for. All the while, I kept thinking, stop, stop doing this and go write your sermon. But there, as I wrestled with a stubborn bolt in a jagged piece of metal, it occurred to me that this is exactly what my sermon is about. Dismantling a system that isn't broken. It wasn't built right. It's the day after Independence Day, a holiday where we celebrate our country's emancipation. Our freedom as Americans, land of the free, home of the brave with liberty and justice for all. And yet I find myself resonating with the words of Ray Montaigne, words he wrote 15 years ago. Love can be a liar and justice can be a thief and freedom is an empty cup from which everybody want to drink. How come I can't tell the free world from a living hell? I am no expert. Keep in mind that I am on my learning journey, but I recently learned about the original drafts of the 13th through 18th constitutional amendments, which would have made slavery legal and unalterable for per perpetuity. Amendments that might have been ratified if it weren't for the timing of the Civil War. And by the way, I've learned the true politics of the Civil War are not exactly what I was taught from my school textbooks. My civics books didn't mention things like the creation of private prisons and the laws created to ensure that people would, of color would continue to be enslaved through mass incarceration. We didn't learn about lawsuits, even in recent years of private prisons suing state police departments because their prisoner quotas had not been met. Prisoners who comprise workforces, by the way, for many for-profit corporations. Forgive me for voicing some speculation, but all this history feeds into the long ingrained biases built into so many of our police departments. My history books didn't mention the times that white folks intervened with city planning, all numbers of things like bridge construction, making sure they would be lowered just enough so that public transportation couldn't even travel those roads to, to provide access to certain neighborhoods. The many cases of eminent domain in the past hundred years, which were presented as progressive, quote, urban renewal, but failed to mention the times that it forcibly erased thriving minority communities with questionable, quote, just compensation from the government, liberty and justice for some. Freedom included relegating people to certain neighborhoods, systematically devaluing education, 
limiting opportunities for advancement, inhibiting ability to take out loans and therefore owning homes or lands or starting businesses. I cannot do justice to the injustices. You know these things if you've experienced them. Others have to learn them and believe them. Perhaps some of you are familiar with a graphic which helps to explain the difference between the terms equality and equity. I made some pictures as to avoid any copyright. In the first picture, there are three boys standing behind a fence trying to watch a sporting event. <laughs> one boy is very tall, one is average height, and the other is short. And in the picture of equality, each boy has been given one wooden crate. It allows the tall boy and the average boy to see what's happening on the other side of the fence, but the short boy is still too short. In the next frame, entitled Equity, the tall boy has no crates. The short boy has two crates, thus allowing all the boys to see what's happening on the other side. I've seen these graphics paired side by side in many contexts, and it does a good job of explaining these two terms. But when it is applied to characteristics like race, it implies that some people are inherently less than others, less capable or less of less value. It isn't about tall and short, stick with me. A more appropriate graphic to start with instead of one where the people side by side look like this. Might be one where there are three boys of the same size, but they are standing on uneven ground, ground that is sloped or perhaps ground which started out level, but dirt from one spot has been shoveled or mounded up on another spot. This leaves one boy standing in a hole, one boy on level ground, and one boy on the top. When we talk about marginalized or disadvantaged populations, we cannot forget that their being is the same capable size as yours or mine, but the ground some have been set on is not the same. This ground, assets and wealth, Yes, including actual ground, property, which some folks have been mounding up for 10, 15, 20 or more generations. Generations? While Black, Indigenous, and people of color are literally just working to acquire enough to bring the next generation up out of the hole they were placed in by a system that was built to oppress. Land of the free? No. Home of the brave? Yes. For about a decade, I worked for Heifer International at the ranch with their experiential education programs. You're going to think I'm trying to sell you on these programs, but let me tell you, they decided to cut them all about a year ago, feeling that youth education does not fall within the mission to end hunger and poverty. For the record, I disagree full heartedly. But these programs were designed to be ex experiential simulations to explore the root causes of hunger and poverty. For hours or days, the groups participated in day to day life scenarios within a closed environment where resources are not distributed equally. In other words, the ground they're placed on is not level. If there is enough for all, why don't all have enough? Was the question asked to thousands of kids over decades before they departed their ranch experience. The answers given to these questions were never comprehensive, nor could they fit on one giant whiteboard, but they did begin to unload the complexities and layers involved with a global systematic issue. This question, though seemingly simple at first, was designed to overwhelm, to extract interactions, 
subtle and not subtle, systematic and of free will, which just took place within the group, the experiences, the experiences of these kids, though the same, were not the same. The experience of kids within one group, though shared, were not the same. After an exhausting experience, to see all of these causes written in front of you on a huge whiteboard, and to have just experienced many of them personally, to some degree, brought participants, according to plan, to the lowest moment of feeling overwhelmed. The power of these programs was converting that feeling into empowerment. First and foremost, we thought about our gut reactions to people who are different for us, from us, not a black and white reflection, a person to person reflection. Acknowledging our gut reactions and our carried stereotypes and then beginning to dismantle them. The debrief continues by filling another whiteboard with the things that make us powerful, tools and skills and contacts and resources that we have. Then we look at that list of root causes on the other whiteboard with very few exceptions. Every single cause that could be written on that board is man-made. And if a problem is created by humans, surely it can be solved by humans. The first step is bringing order to that looming list of root causes by grouping them and breaking them down even further. Then thinking about already established groups who are set up to address those specific things and researching what is it that they really need to be effective? Money, volunteers, awareness? Can we provide any of those things from the power board we just put together? Which of these root causes are things that I am personally perpetuating? Can I change my behavior? What would it take? And who are two or three other people or families that I could encourage to make the change as well? What other communities am I a part of? What resources or power do they have? What could we leverage in them to address more of these root causes? We didn't just send these kids home. We didn't airlift them to a solution. We took them on a journey. We sent them off with some concrete goals and some realistic ideas that they could really apply to their lives back home. And now I wanna give you some homework. If there's liberty and justice for all, why don't all have liberty and justice? Dive into books and podcasts and shows and conversations with people who are different from you. Make lists of your personal biases and the causes of injustice until you are feeling completely overwhelmed. Break it down until you found root causes that are specific enough to be actionable. Outline your power, name your communities, and then act. This is how you dismantle a system that needs to be rebuilt. One piece at a time. Words from the GA services echo in my ears. Let us invoke the power of being ready. Let go of perfection. Be willing to take risks and make sacrifices. Be ready to make mistakes and ask for forgiveness. Trust yourself to take up space in this movement towards freedom and justice for all. I wanna thank John Perez again for being such a great tech host for us and these gatherings. Thank you to those who shared their GA reflections and to our musicians and the voices of our choir. I invite you to join us for Sunday worship next week, July 12th at 11 a.m. with Reverend Jan. 
If you want to learn more about our church or receive your own invitation to these Sunday services or the other things we have going on like midweek coffee hour and discussion groups, please send us an email at uuclr at uuclr.org. As a reminder, you can also use online worship services and online resources provided by the Church of the Larger Fellowship at questformeaning.org or visit the National Youth the National Church website at uua.org. Stay connected with us and local happenings by visiting our website, uuclr.org, and make a financial contribution if you feel so moved to help us continue the work. Before we close each week, we say together words of blessing. These are words that we will put on your screen wherever you are. Please join us together. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person, evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all beings. Thank you for joining in with us today. Stay safe. Stay strong. Stay connected. And happy Independence Day.